Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered him, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Welcome to What is Truth. I'm King. Welcome to another episode of What is Truth. I'm your host, Peyton Arnett. And today we're going to be diving into something that I'm pretty excited about. So episode one, obviously, we went into the basic idea of where the title of the show comes from, where that concept of truth, that question, where that question comes from. And today we're going to go into a series that is along a similar vein. It's not a full series, this is one episode, but it is based off of a sermon series. It is a sermon series I did with my mentor and friend, Pastor Rome, who will be interviewing in the next segment of this very episode. So if you're on YouTube watching this one clip, you'll want to check that out. You can listen to the full episode, of course. But right now, we're just going to kind of dive into where that came from. So Pastor Rome and I did a series at uh, Auburn Adventist Academy Church um, titled The Reason for God. And it is based off this book by Timothy Keller, which is shares the same name, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. And in this book, Tim Keller makes it really simple to understand, but he goes through the reasons for why we believe what we believe, which is kind of the idea of this show, uh, ap apologetics and the defense of the faith. And he made it very understandable. And the title, of course, was, was good, so we decided to go with that. Now, the cool thing about the internet, I, I just love this about the internet, you know, 15 years ago with church, if you missed a sermon, you missed a sermon. But now, due to the wonders of YouTube live streaming, you can watch the Reason for God series that we did on YouTube. You can watch it on Facebook. Uh, the church is, well, I, don't, I don't know where all it's found. I know for a fact you can find it on my YouTube channel. You can find it on Pastor Rome's YouTube channel. You can find it on the church's YouTube channel. There are lots of different ways to access this. And I think that that's really cool that we live in an age where that is the case. In an age of skepticism as well, though. And that's what we're going to get into here. This was a four-part series. A four-part series that we did over the course of four four Sabbaths, four church services, and the first part, I got the honor of kicking the series off. At the time, I was a student pastor at that church, and the title of the, ser uh, the sermon was The Uncaused First Cause, and I, I like the title Uncaused First Cause, and there's a reason behind each and every part of that title. The title Uncaused First Cause comes from the idea that God is uncaused first and foremost, and the reason we insert that in there as Christian apologists is because somebody might ask you the question, almost certainly somebody will ask you the question, who caused God? What caused God? And the point of inserting that word is to essentially get ahead of it, to make sure they understand that when we're talking about God, we're talking about someone who is uncaused. That's the entire point. That's what makes him God. So he's uncaused. He's also the beginning of all things. So when we talk about the Big Bang in science today, people will say, oh, the universe began at the Big Bang. Uh, we as Christians are afraid of the Big Bang, especially I've noticed in the Adventist church we're afraid of the Big Bang, and I think that's because it is tied so closely to Darwinian evolution. Fair enough. We should avoid Darwinian evolution. But the problem is the Big Bang as a concept is basically just saying the universe came into existence at a singular point, a singularity, which is exactly what we believe as Christians. We believe that God uttered the words, let there be light, and everything started from there. So. The Big Bang is exactly what I would expect to happen if God created the universe out of nothing at the beginning of time. And even people like Stephen Hawking say the, uh, the universe and time itself must have had a beginning at the Big Bang. They also say that... <laughs> so Haw Hawking said this, because there's a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Now, Hawking was a good scientist, maybe not the best philosopher. But almost all scientists now believe that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. The question is, what caused the Big Bang? So when we talk even about like Darwinian evolution, it's, it's the idea that we came from somewhere, but they, they say we came from like an amoeba or whatever. But what it does is it just pushes it back, and we never get to that original first cause. So that's why it's called the uncaused first cause, because we're looking for the original point when space, time, and matter it, uh, all together came into existence, which you can call it the Big Bang, but in reality, it's, it's the Genesis account, I believe. And that was just the kickoff point of our series. We went into the evidence behind it. Uh, Tim Keller said this, which was kind of like a, a kickoff to the, to the series. Tim Keller said, Whether you consider yourself a believer or a skeptic, 
I invite you to seek the same kind of honesty and to grow in your understanding of the nature of your own doubts. The result will exceed anything you can understand. And that's kind of like the challenge, you know, to dive into this concept, to find out the reason for God, which is why I found this series to be so powerful. So if you're interested, you can go and watch this series where we go into first the uncaused first cause. And then, of course, we went into four parts. And the second part was Pastor Rome's uh, first part. So it was myself, then Pastor Rome, then myself, then Pastor Rome. And part two was titled um, the, the Christian Synthesis, which, of course, is very philosophy heavy, going into guys like Plato, Aristotle, these guys that society was built around. And, of course, he put, he put it this way. There, um, our society is built on two Germans and two French guys, and by the way, that's those aren't Christian guys. This, this is, we have all of this philosophy in the world today that originated in a place where we don't even realize it, and we can dive into that in the interview in the next segment. But ideas like follow your heart and believe in yourself and these sort of things that you hear in the culture all today, you think they came from like Walt Disney, but in reality they came from people like Kierkegaard different philosophers throughout history have influenced our society in such powerful ways. And Pastor Rome's point in the Christian synthesis was Christianity influenced the world more than anything else. I mean, the reality is is that nobody impacted the world more than Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, another great resource on that would be J. Warner Wallace's um, Person of Interest, Why Jesus Still Matters in a World That Rejects the Bible. So Pastor Rome went into that, and we'll ask him more about his parts of the series in that interview. So in part three, uh, I got the the challenge, I would say, looking back on it, of going through this straight line of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of what a straight line looks like. What was I comparing the universe when I called it just and unjust? So Lewis is making a comparison and making a point. So when he does that, he points out the moral question, the moral argument, which in my opinion is the, the best argument for the existence of God. And, and the moral argument basically says that if objective moral values and truths do exist, if they do exist, then God must exist. Objective moral values and truths do exist, therefore God must exist. And we can go into a lot of detail on this. What I found in the sermon is I packed way too much into it. So if you do go and watch that, pause it a little bit, think about it, you know, because it's all about thinking. The, the encouragement of the reason for God is to get people thinking. So we went through and, of course, reminded uh, as well of another text, which is 1 Peter 3.15, which is the apologetics text. And I believe we went over that last week on what is truth. And that basically says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ. The straight line argument is a great answer for the hope that we have, especially in our belief in a God in general. Now, the moral argument may not get you to Jesus. In fact, it won't get you to Jesus. The moral argument gets you to a theistic God. And a theistic God could be the God of Islam, the God of Judaism, or the God of the Christians. The question is, which one is it? So, that brings us to the point of, uh, a, a, a different point of the historical evidence for the resurrection. But that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other topic. The moral argument simply proves that because moral values and truths are objective. To give you, to give you an example, uh, Adolf Hitler was a evil man. We all agree on that, right? That's why Frank Turk had in his book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, he has a chapter called Mother Teresa versus Hitler to contrast the idea that we all agree Mother Teresa was good and Hitler was bad. But let's say there is no God. How do we know that? Because the reality is Hitler is not wrong if there is no God. But Hitler is wrong and we all know that. We all have like this deep feeling that Adolf Hitler was not right. The question is how do we know that? we don't without God. But God explains it. That's one of the great things about God is he explains the universe as it is so well for us. You look at you look at the answers that Christianity provides. You look at the reasons, the reasons that Christianity provides and you see, oh wow, there is really good evidence for the hope that I have. Calling back to 1 Peter 3.15. C.S. Lewis also said this. This is a very C.S. Lewis centered, uh, centered part. C.S. Lewis said, if I find in myself desires, for which nothing in this world can satisfy. The only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Think about that. You have a desire for food. Food exists. You eat food. Heck, C.S. Lewis, even in that very book, Mere Christianity, says, I have a desire for sex, and such a thing as sex exists. Some food, food exists. Desire for things like sleep. Sleep exists. 
But what about the fact that we always feel like we're missing something? We have this hole that we need to fill. Uh, a God-sized hole, as people have put it. What about that? If nothing in this world world fills that hole, no matter what I do, if I try to fill that with anything, it's not going to work. So that must mean that we were made to have a fulfillment for that, and that fulfillment is not here on Earth. Which must mean we were made for another world, as Lewis said. Mere Christianity? If you haven't checked that book out, check that book out. Um, so, another thing that was important to go over, because C.S. Lewis literally, in that original quote, he said, my argument against God. So he was talking about his journey. Now, I don't know who's listening here. I don't know if you know the journey of C.S. Lewis or not. But C.S. Lewis was an atheist, a devout atheist. And he referred to himself as the most reluctant convert in all of England when he became a Christian. But he still became a Christian. Which tells you something. If he was reluctant and he still became a Christian, that means that there must have been a serious amount of evidence there. And Lewis said that what caused him to be a theist was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. Now again, just so we're clear, this did not convince Lewis on its own for him to be a Christian. It took Tolkien uh, talking to him about that. That's for another time. But Lewis was convinced by the, the, the objective moral standard that we all know exists. Because there has to be something outside of you and I. Because if I disagree with Hitler, what makes me right and Hitler wrong? If it's just my opinion against his, it's just my truth or his truth, which we dissected heavily in the show and will continue to do so. If it's just my truth or your truth, which one of us is right? One of us has to be right and the other one has to be wrong because I think it's wrong to murder millions of Jews in the Holocaust and Hitler thinks that it's right. One of us is correct, one's wrong. That's why we need an objective morality because if we don't have it, then everything's just your opinion against mine. Now, of course, we dive into the moral argument. We realize that we need the standard that is God outside of you and I. And there's so much we could get into here. I use an example of Thor, Love, and Thunder, which at the time of the series had just come out. And literally, the main villain of that film, I don't, I'm not a fan of that film, by the way. That's, that's, that could be something fun we could do. We could review movies. Anyway, the villain of Thor, Love, and Thunder his essential dilemma, his, his reason for the evil he's doing, as he's literally the quote-unquote God killer in the film, is that he's angry at the question of if God, why evil? It's, it's essentially what it is. So, we have problems when something evil happens. That's when it comes into Frank Turk's book, Stealing from God, because if you don't have a standard, it's just your opinion against mine. But if we take that standard and then use that standard to argue against God, we're using God to argue against him. Lewis realized this, and he be believed in God right after that. It didn't take much more convincing than that. He was like, oh, morals exist. God must exist. So then the question becomes, which God is it? And that led into the final part of our series, The Reason for God. And that is when I handed the torch off to Pastor Rome to get into, is Jesus the only way to salvation? Because Christ made exclusive claims. Christ claimed that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. Either you're crazy or you're God. When Jesus claimed that, he was claiming exclusivity, which we don't like that. We don't like the idea that Christianity is the only way because we want to think that we can believe whatever we want, that we can just get to heaven if we're just good enough. For, for example, I hate to throw the guy under the bus. I love Family Feud, but Steve Harvey came out a while back and said that he believed there was many different ways to God. Like as many different TV channels as there are. Like when you're flicking through the channels, that's how many different ways to God there are, Steve Harvey says. The problem with that is that Jesus claimed to be the only way. So that contradicts Islam. It contradicts Judaism. It contradicts any other religion because he claimed exclusivity. You can't believe that someone can be saved through Islam and someone can be saved through Christianity at the same time. It's one or the other. By the way, the Quran literally says to obey the Bible, and the Bible contradicts the Quran. So the Quran debunks itself. That's a whole other discussion. But is Jesus the only way to salvation? Well, that's a question we can ask to Pastor Rome in the next segment when we interview.